Dictionary.com defines success in three ways, but I'm just going to focus on two for this video. The first is being a performance or achievement that's marked by success, such as with the attainment of honors or whatnot, and the second one being the gain of wealth, position, legacy, and such. In this episode of Retro Tech, we're going to be answering the question of, was the GameCube truly successful or not? Before we get into the meat of this topic, we of course need to examine Nintendo's situation before the release of the GameCube. Seeing as how the console came out in 2001, there was really no second thought from anyone as to how sales would perform. In the 90s, Nintendo aggressively sought to dominate the gaming industry, and they damn well succeeded at it. The Game Boy and N64 became staples of this decade and were responsible not only for the success they saw from profits, but most importantly a happy, loyal consumer base. Pretty much you could say that they were killing it at the time. In fact, when the N64 came out in 1996, according to Popular Electronics, which was pretty much a magazine that started all the way back in 62 for tech hobbyists and enthusiasts, the N64 launch was, quote, a much-hyped, long-anticipated moment. But that's not it either. Time Magazine named it, quote, Machine of the Year, and GamePro a gaming-specific magazine from the Times said that many gamers, including a large percentage of their own staff, were already saying that they favored the N64 over the Sega Saturn and original PlayStation. Finally, the piece de resistance was that the console itself sold 300,000 units day one, 32.5 million overall, and ended up making Nintendo around $1.2 billion in profit. This is of course just an estimate, as it's very very hard to find profit numbers on a Nintendo product because they like to keep it secretive for whatever reason. Anyways, does that match the definition of success we showed from earlier? Well, from a financial standpoint, yes. But wait, there's even more. Besides dollar figures, the N64 also managed a nice legacy for itself. Quote from IGN in 2011, the N64 remains one of the most recognized video game systems in history, and its games still have an impact on the games industry. Designed in tandem with the controller, Super Mario 64 and The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time are widely considered by critics and the public to be two of the greatest and most influential games of all time. GoldenEye 007 remains one of the most influential games for the shooter genre." End quote. Our definition of success includes the attainment of honors or legacy as a requirement. So now from both a financial and historical perspective, the N64 was definitely a success. Everything was going great for Nintendo, so what went wrong? Well, with the 90s coming to a close and the 2000s just starting, Nintendo was already looking for the fabled successor to the N64. Work was beginning on this new console in May 1998 and officially announced in August 2000. It was called the GameCube, obviously, and was, to be honest, presented with some pretty nice internal specs for the time. Hardware-wise, you could say it was pretty nasty. With that out of the way, it was time to release the console in Japan in September 2001, and in America, November 2001. Wait, S September 2001? Am, am I reading that correctly? Oh god, <laughs> yeesh. Ooh. Ah, I wonder what else happened in September 2001. In all seriousness though, it really could not have been released at a worse time, especially in America. Now that I'm thinking about it actually, a question that I have is, did 9-11, or more specifically the economic ruin that the event had on the US in the aftermath, take a direct hit to the GameCube sales slash profits from the American markets? I honestly really don't know. Let me know what you guys think down below. People were excited nonetheless. They had really high hopes for this system. Nintendo were so sure of a quick success that they poured at least over, I think, $54 million into commercials and advertising, and the console's launch price of $199 was fairly cheap considering that it was $100 lower 
than that of the PS2 and the original Xbox. Launch day came and went, and well, let's just say that there wasn't a lot to say positively. Let's take a further look at that. Complaints almost immediately poured in following the launch, which actually leads us to our first argument of the video, which, to be completely honest, is the one I feel that most of you guys would agree with, but hey, teach their own. Anyways, the argument is that the GameCube wasn't a success whatsoever, and instead a massive flop on Nintendo's end, and here's why. So while researching this topic, I came onto one of those websites where it's like a forum, but really that you just ask a question and you get an answer back, no real arguments or debates there. I'm sure most of you know it, it's Quora.com. Anyways, I noticed a question that some user asked going, quote, Why was the Nintendo GameCube not as commercially successful as the PS2 or Xbox? Perfect, I said, that's a start. But what really interested me was the reply that this user got. A man named Patrick Dugan, who when I checked out his profile was an almost 30 year Nintendo gamer, left about what I would consider a school essay as to why it wasn't successful, uh, and laid down five key reasons as to why he thought it was a flop. Now, I'm obviously not going to read the entire thing because this video would probably be extended an extra 15 minutes if I did, so instead I'll name the five reasons and very briefly summarize the context of them. Sounds good? Alright. Reason number one, the GameCube could not play DVDs. Pretty much what he's trying to say here was that DVDs were essential to the time, that being the early 2000s when everyone was on the hunt for a DVD player, so when the GameCube came out, it went over the heads of an entire market who wanted not only something to game on, but to watch movies on as well. The PS2, on the other hand, took full advantage of DVDs and thus sold a hell of a lot more than the Xbox and GameCube combined, more on that later. Reason number two, the proprietary Nintendo optical discs. This one needs a little bit of explaining. You see, these are the discs in question, designed by Panasonic. They're smaller than regular discs as seen in this picture. The reason Nintendo chose them in the first place was to A, prevent copyright infringement of its games, and B, to reduce cost and licensing fees. The main problem with this was that the amount of storage that these discs could hold was that of about a gigabyte and a half, while normal sized DVD discs used in both the PS2 and Xbox, for example, being able to hold almost 5 gigabytes of storage. What this meant was that cross-platform ports of games between third parties, like for example a PS2 game converted slash optimized for the GameCube, was virtually non-existent. Reason number three, the GameCube was perceived as a console for children. So here we are a demographic, say what you will, but both the Xbox original and PS2 look bigger, beefier, and especially more visually powerful than the small Petite GameCube. Color black also visually dominated the competition with a plastic finish seeming more appealing in the long run. The GameCube on the other hand was prominently featured in a purple color and came with an actual handle that made it seem less powerful by comparison. It appeared as more of like a portable radio than an actual gaming console. Reason number four, an overall lack of third and second party development support. Historically speaking, Nintendo's never really had that great of a relationship with third-party devs. You see, in the late 80s and early 90s, they treated them very much with hostility. During the time of the N64 was considered the lowest point in the relationship, but that was because the system itself was very technologically complex to develop for. This mindset of isolation from Nintendo only backfired for them, really, because once the GameCube came out, they had some sort of a change of heart and began rapidly trying to get the developers back on for the system, uh, but it was too late for them because most of the devs had long since flocked. What really stung for them was losing one of their most cherished developers, Rare. You know, the ones behind Banjo-Kazooie, Donkey Kong Country, and Conker's Bad Fur Day. We all remember Conker's Bad Fur Day, am I right? And finally, reason number five, a lack of online support. Get this, guys. What if I told you that the GameCube had the ability to connect to the internet, but never fully utilized it? What I mean by that is Nintendo just straight up either forgetting or not caring to put such an important feature into their console. Sure, while you could technically locally connect to players in games like Mario Kart Double Dash, 
No title, as far as I know, made use of the full networking capabilities of the console. On the other side, the PS2 and Xbox original both embraced their online experience, and people just simply voted with their wallets, I don't know. With these five reasons in mind, we have to factor in the impact it had on initial sales. The GameCube ended up selling, well, pretty abysmally, I'm not gonna lie, with a depressing 22 million units sold during its lifetime, compared to that of the Xbox Originals 24 million sold, and the PS2's just wow, extravagant sale numbers at over 158 million units sold, making it, if I'm not mistaken, one of the best selling consoles of all time. Is there any possible argument for this console being a success? Let's find out. I'm gonna be honest with you guys, there isn't a whole lot of arguments for the console proving that it was a success. However, during the second part of my journey into this topic, I came upon a few sources that I found of interest. They're not by any means lengthy and definitely don't prove that the GameCube was successful by the literal definition of it. However, they somewhat succeed at opening up more perspectives that you may refer to as successful in some way, shape, or form. One of these sources took me to a GameSpot forum of all places, where I found some interesting comments let's take a look this comment from user pikmin maniac for example factors a nostalgia and gaming perspective as to the success of the gamecube going quote i'll always remember the gamecube fondly as the system that gave me some of the best games i've ever played i'll never forget pikmin pikmin 2 the wind waker metroid prime metroid prime 2 remake and super smash bros melee these games are all pretty much masterpiece level. It's a quality over quantity thing to me. I had both the PS2 and GameCube during that gen, and quite frankly, I much prefer the Cube. Or this comment that I found while on the subreddit True Gaming by user Risky Raffle, who instead of taking any perspective, he uses the fact that it was a success only because it technically made Nintendo money and didn't just outright destroy the company, such as the Dreamcast did to Sega. Quote, depends on what you consider a success, but I consider the fact that it's sold enough to not put Nintendo into a crisis like the Dreamcast did to Sega a success. Its sales were actually pretty close to the Xbox and there will always be many fans who will hold it and the games it gave dearly. But what Nintendo console doesn't already do that for its fans? However, I also see the GameCube as a bit of a lost generation for Nintendo. Previous to the GameCube, we had the NES, SNES, and N64, all trend-setting phenomenons. And after it, we had the Wii, which was very successful in capturing its market and providing a unique alternative. The GameCube, on the other hand, seems to be a console that didn't have anything that made it essential. Sure, it had many games that have reached cult status with fans, but if you look at the titles on the other consoles that really dominated the generation, you see that this was the generation where Nintendo really started lagging behind. Yes, there were more third-party games here than on previous consoles, but that couldn't make up for how many important games that the GameCube missed that Nintendo had no response to. So what can you take away from this video? Sure, the GameCube was absolutely not a success based on our definition, nor from a financial and historical perspective, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't still call it a success based off of your cherished memories playing with the console and its various games. Remember, just because one or two perspectives are closed doesn't mean that others aren't open to view something through. In fact, I want you guys to let me know in the comments down below. Did you ever play on this console? And if so, what's your favorite memory from it? And also, most importantly, with which argument do you agree or disagree with and why? Anyways guys, thank you for watching the video. Don't forget to click that like button if you enjoyed. Subscribe, hit that notification bell to never miss a video. Follow me on Twitter at Vexor2 to stay up to date with announcements, ideas, polls, etc. And most importantly, have a wonderful day.